Hello, everybody. We are going to just get started in one minute. We're so glad that you have joined us this evening. everybody. I am so delighted that you have joined us for our October Fruition Local Food Showcase. Uh, we have an excellent lineup tonight uh, with three great guests sharing about their businesses. So we'll feature them one, on one at a time with interviews that are around 15 minutes apiece. And we'll have photos to accompany their stories. And we also have two prize giveaways that will happen um, after the second and third interviews. Uh, so before we launch into these conversations, I wanted to let you know that fruition is more than simply a live stream. So the local foods team here at CCE, which includes myself, Flip, but also Lauren Olson, who's dedicated to local food marketing and development, and also um, Erica LaFountain, our community horticulture educator. And we define local food collectively, not just thinking about what you're purchasing or buying from uh, neighboring producers, but also what you might grow or preserve um, at your own land at any scale from a pot to a, a big old landscape to foraging. So when we think about that local food, uh, our fruition blog offers insights about how you can find uh, and source great products from producers such as uh, the ones that you'll meet tonight, but also tips uh, to help you do it at home yourself. So some recent highlights on our blog include a post about how to plant garlic, which it's this, this time of the season, even though it's wildly warm outside, we're getting up to that time. So there's photos and tips about that. Uh, we also have a post uh, with an interview we did recently uh, with Garden Share because they're offering their first ever restaurant week, which is happening right now. Um, and we also recently had a chance, our ag team took a whole bus full of producers earlier in the summer uh, down to Essex County to visit farms down there. And so we have a photo essay all about that. So if you want to see more about the Fruition blog, uh, we invite you uh, to check it out because we've got some good things over there. And if there's any topic that you want to learn more about that will help you get more excited about being an active part of our food system and understanding agriculture in our region, uh, reach out anytime. So I want to give you the lay of the land uh, for tonight's program. So first up, we have Dan Kent of Kent Family Growers. And then we'll talk with Lindsay Schulte, who recently started a vegan cafe in Potsdam called Foster the Plant. And we'll close out the program on a fun note, uh, meeting Dana Lancaster, who raises alpacas um, at Rock Hollow Farm. So a really diverse mix, and we're so excited to hear more from all of our guests. Uh, but before we launch into these conversations, uh, we want to hear from my coworker, Lauren. Uh, she's got the scoop on tonight's prizes. Um, it's free for it to enter for a chance to win, and so she'll tell us what are the prizes and how folks can enter for a chance to get their name in the hat. Hey there, Lauren. Hi, Flip. What a great October evening we have here. Yes, I certainly had a beautiful day outside and tried to get as much done as possible. <laughs> Excellent light. Um, what do we got on the docket for prizes this evening? Yeah, uh, so for tonight, we've got a couple of prizes. Uh, first off, we have a $25 gift certificate to Foster the Plant Cafe in Potsdam. Uh, and also a nice cozy fleece blanket from them. So you can have a nice meal and be warm and comfy at the same time. So that's pretty cool. And then we have a hand knitted alpaca headband from Rock Hollow Farm. And you'll learn all about the alpacas and you maybe can guess which alpaca uh, the headband came from. So pr some pretty cool prizes, I think. Awesome. Yeah, I, I am excited to hear more from Dana about those 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 very interesting animals. <laughs> um, so we'll meet back with you in a few minutes. But before we do, you, you should let people know how they enter for a chance to win. Yeah. Uh, so to enter for a chance to win tonight's prizes, you can click the link below in the comments. And by clicking that link and filling out the prize form, you will be signed up for our Fruition Local Foods blog if you aren't already 
but also entered for a chance to win. And if you've already filled out the form from previous showcases, be sure just to enter again tonight and just click the appropriate box. So everyone tonight has a chance to win a prize. Excellent. So I'll see you after the second interview then, Lauren. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Excellent. All right, so we're gonna welcome on our first guest for tonight's program. And I remember when I moved, first moved back to the area in 2008, I was really eager to learn what the heck was going on up here in agriculture. I'd been away for almost a decade and I wanted to know, get a lay of the land, so to speak. Um, I'd started a small community farm with my partner and one winter we invited all the producers in the area who were offering community supported agriculture or CSA shares to connect with each other and get together and share how we were doing. It feels like years ago, but um, our next guest was one of those people who came together on that wintry day. And I knew right away that this guest was a capable and clever farmer and was a tremendous asset to the North Country growing community. He's diligent and always up for solving a problem. And his no nonsense manner has allowed them to grow their farm over the years um, and become a staple of the produce growers here in the North Country. So we have this mainstay we're welcoming them on tonight uh, so you can hear all about Kent family growers and how they've become such a stable success. Uh, so let's get Dan in here. Welcome, Dan. Let's see. Okay, so Hello. I see Dan, but I don't hear him. There we go. Hey there, um, Dan. I'm not sure if I'm coming through, am I? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, now I can't see anything. Okay. Yeah, so well, Pretty welcome much. to yeah. the program tonight, Dan. I'd love it if you could just share with us, um, tell us more about the farm. Maybe what was your original inspiration for starting Kent Family Growers nearly 20 years ago? Well, I started out naively wanting to save the world from bad agriculture. And uh, uh, I had previously been a, a sort of activist with my fist clenched in the air, railing against uh, societal ills and found I was getting nowhere doing that. So uh, some professors in college turned me on to uh, what was then a, a, the vague notion of sustainable agriculture. and um, save up your money, bought land into it, and soon found that I wasn't going to save the world. I, I might not even save myself. It was very, very hard to make a living. Um, and so the goal became to survive, to hold on uh, and support our family, uh, which we, we've just about managed to, to do here after almost 20 years. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of things I would say that are unique about Kent family growers. And I know you've had an arc in terms of changing in terms of some of the mechanizations or changes that you've made. But let I'd love to if you could tell more um, about what you do and what you grow and, and some things that are unique about your farm. Yeah, KFG is Kent family growers is a, a farm like many in the Northeast, uh, small, diversified, certified organic. Uh, we grow almost everything in the uh, seed catalog, like Johnny's uh, uh, from Maine, uh, little bits of all of these things to supply mostly uh, direct markets. Uh, our CSA is the, the largest of those. Uh, we also attend the Canton Farmers Market. Uh, all, of our, uh, all of our local markets want uh, small amounts of many, many different things. They, they want a, a farmer's market like variety. So we well, we pursue that uh, to a large extent. However, uh, some things make sense uh, in, in terms of production to do at a larger scale. So we've developed wholesale markets in New York City where we, uh, we send pallets off, uh, pallet-sized orders off every week uh, to a venerable co-op in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And that allows us to be more efficient at producing our local offerings uh, as well. So the, the mix of local and regional uh, and direct and wholesale markets is, uh, is matching the, the mix of, of vegetables. Uh, we're, we're, we're somewhat diverse uh, in, in both. 
Yeah, so you have those direct markets as you were mentioning. I see I see your products in Nature Storehouse and the Potsdam Co-op where folks can buy them direct, but then you also mentioned um, the farm share, the CSA share. I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, we started that um, many years ago uh, with a very small number of shares. I, I wish I could remember who our first 11 or 14 CSA members with. I think most of them are still with us. They're they're an extraordinary bunch, uh, very faithful, uh, very supportive. We grew very slowly. Each year we would add uh, some small number of shares. Uh, we're currently at about 250 shares in the summer. Uh, it's, it's about what we can manage to serve with our current labor force. Um, and then uh, the crew goes home uh, here in just a few weeks um, and we, uh, uh, just ourselves, just our family, serves a, a about 100 uh, winter shares through the winter. Uh, the CSA doesn't quite go year round. We, we take a little, uh, I'm gonna put air quotes around break uh, in the late winter, early spring uh, while we're getting the next growing season started. Uh, but we're, we're nearly year round with marketing uh, and the CSA is the largest part of that. Yeah, I've certainly noticed and I think we've talked before about how um, being nearly year round and having that offering and being consistent year over year for your shareholders or your members really makes a difference in terms of knowing that they're that you're there for them um, in terms of finding that access to those fresh uh, organic produce items. And we've talked about that. I think that's one of the questions I was asking about talking with you about in terms of uh, how how do you um, how do you serve customers or think about that? And it seems like one of the main things that you believe in is that kind of consistency and stability is really essential to, to building a foundation for, for your farm and, and for the folks buying your food. Yeah, we, we try to be uh, reliable, consistent in as many things as we can uh, because many things uh, fall out of our control. We, uh, we struggle probably like anybody, maybe more so, with, uh, with certain crops and uh, my weekly newsletter uh, during the summer CSA season uh, is uh, unfortunately full of apologies for uh, how something is, won't be available uh, because it's rotting uh, in rain or it isn't available because it's desiccated by drought or woodchucks have eaten it. Uh, yeah, we, we, we fail. Uh, often enough that um, uh, I'm impressed that uh, our reputation is one of consistency and reliability. It's, uh, it's an incredibly discouraging business. If you take these failures personally, you, it, it, it can lay you pretty low. Um, but each of these newsletters explaining short crops or, or, or crop failures is, uh, is met with a, a response from, from some customers maybe the only the most understanding uh, that we understand this is why we signed up for CSA to, to ride the roller coaster of the growing season we're with you um, that's always incredibly heartening and and actually ends up being a, a pretty considerable part of the the recompense we get for this work is the the direct uh, connection we have with our, our very uh, wonderful bunch of customers uh, yeah it, it's a uh, I like to say that uh, everybody in business makes mistakes. It's how you respond to them. And sometimes some businesses will make mistakes and not know uh, what, what effect they have. Uh, we have uh, a direct link to our customers. The, the direct marketing is also directly uh, connected by communications so that we, uh, we get feedback and can react. Uh, in a, in a, sometimes not immediately. A lot of things on a farm happen year to year. I, I know every year I, I have this experience of doing something, re recognizing it as having been done wrong and saying, well, 12 months, we'll try it again. Uh, hopefully do it better. Yeah, it is kind of incredible. Yeah, we, we really enjoy it. There's just, a, yeah, there's just like innumerable possible risks and then just constant decision making and, and prioritizing. And I think you're, I would say you're being humble, Dan, honestly, because 
um, that that transparency for your CSA shareholders and letting them know what's going on, I think, is one of the aspects um, that people appreciate about CSA, knowing knowing what's going on and dedicating themselves to a farm or a place and saying we want to support you continuing to be able to grow. And um, it's great that you are able to share those successes, but also the difficult parts because we have such um, challenging weather and and um, there's pests and diseases and all manner of things, but um, I, I, bet, I bet that your shareholders appreciate that um, honest communication. Um, I was curious um, if you wanted to share a little bit more about uh, maybe some, some fun parts, maybe what do you find most satisfying? We know there's a lot of difficulties, there's a lot of risks, um, and it's a, it's a very short season. You're packing a lot in and you're growing a lot of food for wholesale and direct markets. But what do you find, what do you find satisfying of being, about being a, a farmer or a food producer? Working outside on a day like today, it was a custom ordered 100% uh, per perfect day and we were planting garlic and pretty happy about it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it can be repetitive, uh, oppressive work uh, on a gruesome, uh, day we, we've planted garlic in the recent past in snowstorms. Uh, I wouldn't be bragging about that, but today I was I was pleased as punch to be outside. Uh, back to the customers, uh, our, our whole circle of, of friends uh, come from our customer base. They're such a great group. Uh, we we feel like we filtered the community for for an especially interesting and vivacious bunch uh, that we get regular weekly contact with. Um, the relationship we have with our workers is extraordinary. I, I, we work 10 hour days and if you have to spend 10 hours a day with people, they should be good people. And boy, they are. We hire men from Mexico every year with H2A visas. And, uh, though there's many, 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 many heartaches associated with that program every year, uh, the overall experience is just sublime. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful. Uh, people that I, I adore uh, and am thrilled to, to work with every day. So those are some of the some of them, the things that are, are positive. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Um, I guess I'm curious. We talked a little bit um, about how we wanted to we wanted to feature you on the program, and you said, "Sure, well, I'll do it. Fine," but you weren't necessarily um, seeking necessarily. I, I think you have high CSA retention and your CSA is often full, um, but I wanted to get people to know about Kent Family Growers and what they do and how they do it. So it sounds like you have the demand and you have the customers that you want, whether they're wholesale or direct for the most part. Um, but what would be your advice for community members who are interested in being a more active part of the food system or getting involved in some way? start a farm. There's room. I think uh, we have a large waiting list both summer and winter uh, that were because of labor issues. Again, back to that visa program. Uh, we struggle to staff up uh, to increase our acreage and mechanization uh, for a variety of reasons to, to meet demand. Um, so get started. It's about like becoming a doctor. You'll invest about the same amount of money and the same amount of time, and it's almost as hard, but not quite. So uh, we need more doctors too, actually, and nurses. Um, so farming or, or medicine, either one, go for it. Uh, <laughs> you do get yeah, to be do. outside though we, for the farming. Yeah, hospitals, I, I wouldn't do so well working in those fluorescent lit hallways. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the demand uh, for CSA is there. Uh, there's also, I think, demand serving local schools. New York State has uh, quite a bit of money sloshing around to buy local produce uh, to make its way into schools for kids to eat fresh, fresh produce. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, there's anywhere near enough production to satisfy even our little local circle of schools. So. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to mentor people. Uh, if, if anyone wants to get started, I, I did a, in a farm apprenticeship in Maine uh, with some folks that didn't really know what they were doing, uh, but I would like to uh, uh, better mentor than I had. And uh, and I, some, some really helpful things I could probably uh, tell you not to do. 
and maybe a couple to, to do also. Well, we're glad that you stuck it out with the highs and lows of and and the challenging market that we have in general here in the North Country. Um, we're we're closing out on time, but I was wondering if there's anything else you wanted to share um, with our listeners about Kent Family Growers or about local food, about uh, the food system, any other thoughts that you'd like to leave folks with? Mm. Uh, well, that's such a general question I, I i'm not prepared for it. <laughs> uh, i'll show a nice flower photo while you're uh, thinking oh, of it. It. <laughs> okay um no here it is uh <laughs> i believe that we sh the north country should identify itself by some food item we should uh be like maryland is for crab cakes or napa valley is for grapes um, and I think that it should be parsnips. Uh, somebody in Minnesota tried to make rutabagas a, a thing uh, to hang their hat on, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's what we should try. Let's go for par <laughs> parsnips. Uh, somebody uh, make a, a, a delicious parsnip fritter restaurant that specializes in parsnip fritters, and uh, put ourselves on the map for that. I'll grow them. A couple other people grow them. Somebody, some food entrepreneur gets the fryer going, and uh, St. Lawrence County is famous. All right. So maybe Lindsay needs to install some fryers at Foster the Plant. That's what I'm hearing. Those could be vegan, right? It's possible. Uh oh, I don't know if he's up for it. But so that means there's room. There's room in the food system for this. Uh, this new venture. <laughs> uh, will you? Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've joined us tonight, Dan, and I, and though he's saying he just has a wait list um, and you may or may not be able to get into the share, if you ever want to learn what Kent Family Growers is up to, you can find them on the website um, at the Canton Farmers Market on Fridays, I believe, during the season um, and find their items in uh, Nature's Storehouse and Potsdam Co-op. And are there any other local outlets that I'm forgetting, Dan? Big Spoon Kitchen. Oh yes, and regularly pots. on the mood. Yeah, regularly on the menu at Big Spoon. Well, we appreciate you joining us tonight, Dan, and I uh, hope you get some rest. I'm sure you've got lots of roots to dig over the next few weeks. You bet. If it ever gets cold, then I guess you'll get to dig those parsnips. <laughs> That's oh. right, we're waiting for some cold. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, you take care, uh, and um, yep. we'll get Lindsay in here in just a moment. Have a great night, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everybody. Okay, so let's see if, um, so I'm just seeing, are, are folks seeing the photos? Someone just said that they weren't seeing the photos. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, all right. Well. Dan Kent actually just mentioned um, Big Spoon Kitchen. Big Spoon Kitchen is actually one of the 12 participating food businesses um, this week in Garden Shares Restaurant Week, uh, which also includes Foster the Plant Cafe, who you'll hear from in just a moment. So if you haven't heard about it yet, um, check out Restaurant Week either on Garden Shares Facebook page or you can check it out on their website, gardenshare.org. Uh, basically, there's 12 participating businesses and they all um, are sourcing or featuring uh, local food at somewhere in their menus. So support them this week. I believe it's ending on the 23rd. So you've still got a few days to visit Foster the Plant or one of the other dozen participating businesses for restaurant week. Um, let's get Lindsay in here just a moment. Um, so I guess in keeping with that theme uh, of first encounters, I mentioned, I remember back when meeting uh, Dan, I also remember exactly when I met our next guest, Lindsay. Um, she and her husband and their young family had just moved to Potsdam a couple years ago. Um, and I think pretty shortly after she moved and they were settling in the area, she reached out to us at the Ag and Food Systems Department. She wanted to know what was going on in the region. Uh, farmers that were um, so that she could source local produce from, and she wanted to learn more about our farm uh, to table initiative, where we were offering free professional photo shoots to farms and food businesses here in St. Lawrence County. And within the year, she had opened up a brand new cafe in downtown Potsdam. I think, I mean, I might, could be wrong, but I might say it might be Potsdam's first ever vegan eatery. 
Um, and on the walls of her cafe, she featured some of those uh, photos from the photo shoots and since has had one of her own. So we really welcome her um, joining in so mightily to the food system and the scene here um, in Northern New York and doing it with gusto. Um, and enthusiasm. And actually just newly this um, year, she also joined Cornell Cooperative Extension on our board of directors. So we really are glad to have her on um, bringing her passion and enthusiasm uh, for healthy communities and healthy food options. So we'll get Lindsay Schulte in here so we can learn more about Foster the Plant Cafe. Hey there, Lindsay. Hey. <laughs> so we'd love to learn more. Tell us about Foster the Plant. Sure. Well, yeah, I haven't looked back so many years in Potsdam, but I believe we're the uh, only vegan cafe or plant-based cafe to be here ever. Um, and probably the next closest one would, would be down in Syracuse. Um, so we're definitely uh, trying to reach out to that group of individuals that have gone plant-based and vegan and uh yeah it's exciting up here so i've heard you when we talked before um so the the restaurant i think just started in late 2019 is that right mm -hmm. um and i've heard you talk before about um your mission and goals for the cafe um would you would you share that with us what some of the passion that you bring to this new food business yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, when, when we moved here a couple of years ago, uh, we were looking for ways to improve the community and, and something that we can contribute uh, to people here in Potsdam and the surrounding communities. And uh, my family is plant-based eaters and we didn't have a whole lot of choices on like a fully uh, vegan menu to eat at. And we said, there are amazing farms up here. Uh, we can get this great produce locally sourced. And, uh, you know, where we came from in Cleveland, it was, you know, getting trendy to have plant-based uh, eateries. So uh, we said, why don't we do this? Um, and, th and that was where it started. And really a lot of our ideals are in our mission. So supporting the community by sourcing locally, um, our artwork is done by local artisans. Our tables are done by local woodworkers. Um, we really try to support those that live here in the community and showcase all the talent that's here uh, right at your doorstep. Um, oh, isn't that pretty? Um, <laughs> but the, the chairs in the picture, those plastic ones, they are... Um, upcycled plastic chairs that have been uh, melted down from plastic and repurposed. Um, even our, our couches are upholstered with renewable resources. Um, and if you look at those bulk bins back there, you may notice that those used to live at the Potsdam Co-op. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we really try to take uh, a lot of different goals of ours from uh, plant-based eating, locally sourcing, uh, supporting local artisans, um, and then uh, doing the environmental impact. Like how can we do as little damage to the environment here as we can? Um, so we compost all of our food scraps. We have local farmers that pick it up. Um, we use compostable uh, materials for our takeout containers. Um, we really try to make decisions uh, based on the impact instead of maybe the cost. Yeah, so it sounds like you pretty much already answered my next question was I, I was going to tease out of you some of the ways that you kind of collaborate with other local businesses or artisans, but it sounds like it's ingrained in in um, the ideals of the business. So it, you, you see it everywhere throughout um, your business activities. Um, so I guess we better talk about the menu. Tell us about some of the things you like about the menu. What can find people find at Foster the Plant? Yeah, so we started our menu really small uh, because we opened in the end of 2019. We, we did not plan on COVID happening three months later. So we started with smoothie bowls, um, avocado toast, some different salads. We had a salad bar here. Um, and, and once COVID hit our whole menu, we shook out and rearranged and threw a whole new uh, slew of plant-based items on there. 
Um, some of our most popular items that we that we make here are buffalo tofu. Um, a lot of us will say, oh, I don't like tofu because um, it's this squishy white stuff that doesn't taste like anything. Uh, but if you cook it really good, like I don't like the squishy white stuff either, but if you cook it really, really good, um, it's delicious. Um, and we make a homemade ranch sauce with it and we use locally sourced dill for that. And it is out of this world. Um, so that's a really, really hot item that we make. Um, and the, the tofu actually comes from down in Rochester. It's an organic uh, tofu made uh, down there called Soy Boy. Um, and then our other item that's always super fun to have um, guests who may not know that we're a vegan restaurant. Uh, we make some omelets here and they're not made with eggs, um, but the eggs are actually made out of uh, mung beans and I can count a dozen people over the last couple of years who have said, oh my gosh, these omelets, these are the best omelets I've ever had. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you. Uh, have you had a vegan omelet before? And they say, what? Um, what is this made out of? Um, and we tell them like, oh my gosh. Um, it's, it's exciting to bring foods that people may not uh, think about being vegan and make them delicious and then have people go, whoa, I can, I can eat this way and, and I can be sustained on, on plants and, uh, uh, and be full. So it's, it's really, really awesome. The other delicious item that we have on our menu is our bread. Um, the Potsdam Co-op Carriage House Bakery makes our bread and it's so delicious. I could eat a whole loaf all at once and I could say most of my customers would too. And some of them do, they just order, I have people just ordering slices of toast, just toast with butter. Um, <laughs> um, and that's how good the bread is. So kudos to the Potsdam Co-op for nailing the recipe on bread. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't do a lot of our menu without that. Yeah, so you have mentioned, and actually I forgot to include this on, them on this list that I'm about to show. So I'm glad that you mentioned the Potsdam Food Co-op. There are other, I was thinking of the produce uh, and, and the, the fruit and things like that. But tell us more about some of the other uh, farms and food businesses that you found to source from uh, to put on the menu at Foster the Plant Cafe. Yeah, we use a ton of different farms uh, along the region. I have a, a whole board up in front of me uh, during restaurant week. We really want to applaud the farmers um, that are growing all these delicious foods. Um, I don't know if I can get on the, we should be the parsnip capital of the world, but I'm willing to try. For Dan, <laughs> I would totally try. Uh, <laughs> uh, but his, his food's amazing. Um, Martin's Farm Stand, I routinely go to uh, multiple times per week. Um, Zook Family Farm, uh, Plant Growers, Fuller's Farm, Witten Family Farm, Bird's Foot, uh, Deer River, Windmill, uh, make some delicious maple syrup. Um, and then we work through the North Country Grown uh, Cooperative um, to get some, uh, some other items uh, when we need them. So. We're always looking for people to grow garlic scapes for us for our delicious pesto. Um, I, I order those by like the 30 pound bags uh, of pesto. <laughs> but, you know, I, I love meeting up with all these farmers and I, I know I'm not as eloquent as Dan Kent is, um, but I could listen to him talk all day. Uh, but all the farmers are just so wonderful. Um, I. I do not have a green thumb, <laughs> um, but when I go in and I have questions, like they tell me so much information on growing and the conditions and you know what I should be sourcing right now. And they're just so wonderful and open to giving uh, information and advice um, uh, to me and everybody there really. Yeah, it is really great. I, I find, uh, food producers to be really open. I think there is kind of a humility, um, yeah, that it's challenging work and there, we know that there's these pleasures, but we wanna make sure other people are able to get the info they need. And I find it to be, I agree, to be a really open and, and generous group. Um, I'm curious, we might be getting around probably your two year anniversary. I'm curious um, what you're thinking about these days 
Um, mm -hmm. We could talk about how things have changed over the last couple of years, or if you want to talk about what's going on now or the future um, about Foster the Plant. Yeah, sure. Um, we're always thinking of ways to support the community. Um, we get a lot of people in here saying, oh, I wish you had this, or I wish you bottled that, or I wish I could just pick this up for dinner. Um, so we're really thinking about how we can do some of those things. So um, we would love to bottle some of our dressings. Um, a lot of people ask for bottles of our dressing. So that is, you know, a plan down the road. Um, I currently have uh, a double commercial oven being installed uh, behind me over here because our demand for buffalo tofu um, is so big. We, we literally have been cooking out of a half oven, like a little half oven. So I can only make like a batch of things at a time. So we just cook all day long. So now we're going to be able to like uh, times that by a dozen at one time. Um, so me and the staff are just so excited uh, to be able to cook faster and, and do more food. Um, this Saturday and the next three Saturdays after that will be uh, with the St. Lawrence County Arts Council uh, with their songs at the stable. And we are going to be, we don't have a truck, but we'll be like a food truck. Um, so we'll be catering uh, food out of there that you can come and purchase for dinner. And uh, we're doing items that um, are not on our menu here. So it will be uh, very exciting to see what people think of the nice hot food items that we're bringing. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, that does sound, that does sound exciting. Um, so you said you were before, I don't want you to go without telling everybody about that cool project that you're doing as part of Restaurant Week. Oh. Nobody get dizzy. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're doing a paint by number. Uh, Liza Page is a great artist up here in Potsdam. And we have a paint by number going on. Oh, let's see. So we are filling. Oh, it's like that backwards. There you go. We're filling the wall. Oh, there we go. Um, we're filling the wall with a whole new enormous uh art piece that's uh, showing underground. So root vegetables um, and then overground, we've got a tractor and different bugs and animals. Um, and if you donate to Garden Share, you can pick a number and you can come and paint and leave your mark on Foster the Plant. And you can, you can come and paint all day. That would be fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, that does look, I remember seeing the pic of the finished, the graphic and it's super colorful, really lively, lots of different animal, uh, lots of different plant life. I just like the earthworm touch. That's definitely great. Um, well, I think we're getting close to the end of time, but I just want to make sure folks know um, that they can find you in person. Um, there we go. Um, that your cafe is open seven days a week. And is it true that people could also order um, online for pickup? Yeah, so our website, www.fashiotheplant.com, you can go right on there. You can place an order online for pickup, um, and you can just come in and tell us your name, and your order will be ready for you most most of the time. That whole staffing issue that Dan talked about, we we all kind of have that going on. So, um, so, yeah, just give us about 30 minutes from your order placement, and we'll have your food ready for you. Yeah, I think that that is a really, um, I think it's a good point. It's a good to be patient with everybody because there's so many uh, different uh, disruptions and things going on all across the food system and everyone's continuing to work hard and do their best. But um, these are unexpected times and, and we're all, uh, we're in it together. And so remember to be friendly and uh, hungry at your next uh, farm stand or eatery. Uh, is there anything that you have to add, Lindsay, before, uh, before we let you go? No, I just, you know, welcome everybody here and I hope you come and try some of the food. It is not scary food. It is delicious food from the farmers down the street. So uh, please come join us and be part of the Faster the Plant family with us. 
Excellent. It was a pleasure talking with you during the program, Lindsay. Um, get out. Remember to visit Foster the Plant Cafe anytime nine to two and restaurant week is going on through Saturday. But you can go there on Sunday, even if it's not restaurant week anymore. It's still a good time to support our local businesses. Thank you so much and have a great um, rest of your October, Lindsay. All right. Thank you so much, Flip. <laughs> Take care. Okay, well, Lindsay generously donated a $25 gift certificate to Foster the Plant Cafe along with one of their uh, uh, fleece blanket with a logo on it. So we have a lucky winner. We better get Lauren in here so we can find out who that person is. Where is our prize master? Hey, Lauren. Hello, uh, I'm pretty hungry. I had one of their buffalo tofu wraps and I'm, I'm one of the fans of, of those wraps, I would say. Pretty yeah, fabulous. we had some of that at the um, the outside, the open air board annual meeting, the little gathering that we had. And mm -hmm. I saw multiple people who I never mm -hmm. would have thought would be eating buffalo tofu, really uh, lapping it up. So very tasty. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, let's figure out who the prize winner is. All right, let's spin the wheel here. Colorful wheel. And it looks like so Rose. Awesome. Congratulations, Rose. Congratulations, Rose. So you've won the $25 gift certificate to foster the plant cafe along with one of their cozy blankets. It, theoretically, it will get cool outside sometime <laughs> uh, and, that, and then you can use it to cozy up. Uh, what is our last prize of the evening and how can folks win it, Lauren? Our last prize of the evening is a hand-knitted alpaca headband from Dana and her her herd, her flock. I don't know. She, she could tell us uh, of alpacas. Um, and you can sign up where there's a link in the comments and you click it, fill out the form, and you'll be entered for a chance to win the last prize of the evening. Excellent. So we'll 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 find the prize winner. If you've already entered, you don't need to enter again, but we'll find the prize winner after our conversation with Dana in just a moment. And it's free to enter. You just get you're basically signing up for our fruition blog so you can get the latest info, gardening tips and, and farmer stories and profiles and things like that. So it's free to do and we hope that you'll sign up. We'll see you in a few minutes, Lauren. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna get Dana in here in just a moment. Um, so I've known our next guest for the shortest period of time, I would say, but I remember my childhood neighbor always said, I may have been born yesterday, but I stayed up all night. And that's how I feel like with Dana, that it's only been a short period of time, I've known her for just over a year. She joined one uh, a whole series of our marketing webinars online when the Ag and Food Systems Department was starting to flock online uh, to do programming and she was, um, so curious and, and so knowledgeable and warm and excited to keep learning more um, to let people know more about Rock Hollow Farm and all the things that she loved about raising alpacas and how to find her products. So she was a delight uh, to meet and get to know. And now I'm excited for for you uh, to meet her. And I know we've been calling it the Fruition Local Food Showcase, and this is probably our first and maybe only exception, but Dana was so uh, warm and generous and open and excited about sharing about Rock Hollow. And we thought, well, I think people would be pretty excited to see some pictures of alpacas and learn more about this uh, unique animal. So we said, yes, let's do it. We'll have Dana on the show. So before, uh, without any further ado, we'll learn more about Rock Hollow Farm and Herman from Dana Lancaster. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hi, Flip. <laughs> hey there, how are you doing, Dana? It's a good evening. Excellent. Um, so we want to learn more about Rock Hollow Farm. Tell us. Well, um, I retired and moved back home because I was raised and graduated from Canton High School. Um, and part of my life was uh, spent on a dairy farm. I knew I wanted to come back to farming, but I wasn't really interested in starting back up with a herd of cows. So I explored prior to coming home um, into alpacas and the fiber that they offer, not breeding for sales. I have all boys um, and I learned how to spin, which I absolutely love. And their fiber is amazing and makes an incredible exotic yarn. 
And that's how I started. I knew I wanted to get the boys on the farm. Yeah, so I it is a it is a herd, right? We're gonna use the right terminology. Yes. We're gonna use yes, alpaca it terminology. Is a herd. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so you have a herd, you have all males, you don't do any breeding necessarily, but you're able to um uh tend these animals and then uh get uh fleece from them year in and year out for quite a few years, right? Like what is the tell us about um the lifespan of alpacas and, and how they behave and things like that. Well, like I said, they are all boys, so there is no babies on the farm. Um, they can live uh, 18, 20 years. Uh, my boys are probably middle-aged now. They're probably around 14 years old, almost all of them. Um, we've lost a few. We've gained a few. Um, they are shorn once a year, and um, it's super easy to process their fleece. They don't have lanolin like sheep. So there's not that grease involved. So it's very easy to handle. And as I said, super wonderful to spin. Yeah, I can tell it's very clear when we visited your farm and got to take some photos, a beautiful property in Herman, but I could tell you have a, such fondness for the herd. And I can't say I could keep track of all of their <laughs> names, but it's impressive to me how you're able to um, actually tie my pictures are going the wrong direction, but actually tie your hand knit items to specific uh, to which animal they came from. And I, I think that that's really neat and unique, not just the warmth and the capacity of the alpaca as a, a fiber, but also that connection to specific animals in your finished product. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the yarn is actually sold by all the boys. So if you visit the website and you like one of the natural colors of the boys, well, it will be under yarn by fluff or yarn by tuxedo because they, I have to give them credit. They are the actual producers of the yarn. So they are the ones that are offering their product for sale. Yeah, it is incredible. So how you chose you chose alpacas. Tell us a little bit more about about the fleece. You mentioned that they're not being lanolin. What else do you like um, about alpaca fiber? Well, alpaca fiber is actually warmer than uh, cheap wool. So it is a hollow fiber. So it traps the air inside the fiber. So it makes it that much warmer on the scale. Um, I felt that was a wonderful fit for the North Country. It works beautifully knitted into things like cowls and headbands and hats, uh, mittens and half mitts. Uh, it is so soft. It is something that you want to wear around your head and on your hands. Yeah, that is that is pretty neat. I remember seeing you just recently actually um, at the open air craft food and yep. wine market in Madrid and, and your beautiful setup there. Um, and it sounds like you probably get to people come out of the woodwork uh, wanting to probably learn more about alpaca and the fiber um, and the hand knits that you that you knit. Well, yeah. And when I get to go to these and if it's a picture that I think you're showing, my daughter is in the picture with me as well. Um, I really enjoy sitting there and spinning. Um, uh, brings a lot of people over. They have a lot of questions, but I just love to share about, you know, how this yarn comes about and what the alpacas have to offer um, as a fiber animal versus just having babies to sell. So, you know, people don't understand sometimes where yarn actually comes from, how it's twisted, how it, um, you know, just by treadling a little wheel, it can become such a fantastic uh, knittable item. So you have, you have, um, I had to, <laughs> you might have forgotten all the great terms that you taught me, you know, <laughs> so you have. You have quite a few different things available. Someone could buy roving, but they could also buy yarn or finished um, alpaca knit products. Is that right? Sure. Sure. So um, the neat thing about the alpaca fiber is that it can be utilized at any different stage. So you can market uh, the fleece right off the animal. So it comes specifically with all the wonderful hay and dirt and everything else associated with it. And then that person can take that piece of fiber and go straight from, you know, off the animal to whatever product they wanted to do. 
Um, I also sell roving. I send then the fiber to a mill. It comes back in spinning roving. So that can be used by other spinners. Um, I sell the yarn after I have spun it. And then, of course, finished products that I have made with their yarn. Yeah, if I remember correctly, you actually came at this uh, in terms of being a producer or raising alpaca from your love of fiber and being part of other fiber uh, groups uh, before uh, raising your own animals. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it really started um, by touring some farms down in Pennsylvania before I moved back home. Um, I joined a guild down there and really was just enamored by all the talent that is offered by all the people that work with different kinds of fiber whether it's uh, rug hooking or weaving or uh, doing needle felting or wet felting, there's just so many different things that you can do with fiber. That's amazing. So I love if you're, you're so you're about seven years in with Rock Holler Farm. I'm yep. curious um, if there's anything you want to share that's coming up that might be changing or if there's anything that you find particularly satisfying as you kind of settle into this routine with your, your favorite herd. Uh, what would you, anything else you'd like to share about the farm? Well, I do, I do want to share one thing. I could never do any of this at, without my husband. He is such an integral part of the farm. Um, it's, it's never a single person's uh, thing that they do as the other presenters also shared as well. So he's a very, very big part of the farm. Um, I have started the website I work at updating it the best I can, um, but I do encourage people if it's something that they see that they like to contact me um, just by a text or telephone or through the email that goes on. And I'm more than willing to answer any questions. I have hosted people out to the farm before um, and more than willing to share what goes on from the spinning to the animals themselves. Before we let you go, though, Dana, we need to solve this riddle. What is this whole thing about spitting? What do we need to know? Is it true or, <laughs> about alpacas spitting and what's going on there? Okay, so yes, alpacas spit. That is their defense. That is their attitude. Um, in my herd, um, they will spit with each other. They get in personal space. They get upset. Somebody stands too closely. Uh, however, it is extremely rare um, that literally an alpaca will just come up, look in your face and spit on you. Um, I can't say it hasn't happened with Fluff. He's a unique one. Um, however, normally if you don't want to get spit on by an alpaca, don't stand in between the two that are spitting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that applies to just every creature. Like if there's yeah. any spitting going on, don't stand between Avoid them. it. Yeah, we're going to stand right away, yeah. I feel like we would all be better with that advice. It's not even alpaca specific. Um, well, excellent. It's really been a pleasure to have you on the program today, Dana. I hope folks will visit uh, your website and then reach out. Um, it sounds like you're very open to finding what folks are interested in, giving them the information to find the product that they, they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Thanks for joining us, Dana. Thank you, Flip. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Take care. Well, awesome. We just had fun. Lauren and I got a chance to go out to visit Dana's last month and they're beautiful animals. They're certainly, we didn't get into that really, but they're not like, a, you're not like gonna get up close and give them a big hug. That's not really a good idea, but just an incredible, incredible and very resilient animal. Um, so we have a chance you can win. You just heard how soft and warm they are. Um, there is a, Dana has donated an alpaca headband, so we better get Lauren in here uh, so we can find out who the winner is, lucky winner is. I'm gonna spin the wheel of fortune here. <laughs> All right, okay, so let's do it. Flashy something. <laughs> let's see. Maybe warm out now, but it's gonna get cold. And Erica. Awesome. 
congratulations, Erica. We will email you with the details about how you can uh, get your mitts on that uh, warm headband. <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for joining us uh, this evening. I don't think I said it yet, actually, but our next program is the third Wednesday of next month. And I don't know if I can quickly do the math. I think it's November 17th. But we hope you'll join us then. Uh, we have one of the producers, the Killian Biohoff, uh, which is a biodynamic organic beef farmer in Governor. So we look forward to talking with Suzanne uh, next month, and we'll get two more co we'll get two more guests, and we'll let you know this month who they are. Um, and before we forget, you have a few more days to be involved uh, with Garden Shares Restaurant Week. Uh, so there's a couple more days. Find online the dozen participating businesses. Uh, go out, you can eat in or take out. There's lots of different options. Uh, so we hope that you'll enjoy uh, some good local dining over the next couple days. We have uh, one uh, Big Spoon Kitchen, as we mentioned, Lindsay, uh, that Dan, they source from Dan. So there's multiple kind of interconnections um, in our food system, folks supporting each other um, and working together to make it all happen. So we hope that you'll get out there and, and eat some tasty food. Join us next month on November 17th and have a great autumn.